you, Mark. Props. Props. Our conversation is props. How you doing, brother? I'm well. Thank you for having me. Couldn't have it any other way. This is lovely. What's that? This is a water bottle. It's gin. No, it's not. It's, it's, uh, it, this is a water bottle. Um, it's lovely. It is. I'm a designer as well as a photographer, but designer by you know, birth, I think. And, uh, and anything that's interesting and different and new uh, just piques my interest. And so, this thing doesn't roll off the table. It's great. So let's start there. What, is, it, is it the way it feels in your hand, or is it the way it looks, or both? Originally, it was the way it looks. I was just curious, because um, I wouldn't carry water bottles around as much as I should, because they didn't fit in all my backpacks or pockets or things. This fits in back pockets of jeans. Fits in like a thin side pocket of a backpack. It just fits. It fits anywhere that like big round bottles don't, and I think it's genius. It's made by a, it's called Memo Bottle. It's designed by a company in Australia. And what Memo Bottle? It's great. Memo. What caught my eye was that they designed they designed their original water bottle is an A5 water bottle, and it's like the the footprint of an A5 pad. You know, it's just it's an, it's an interesting excuse me, odd thing. It's not actually very practical, because I got one. I went, well, that's neat. I, what do I do with this? <laughs> like, it doesn't fit anywhere. Uh, and then I saw they made this as well, and I, so I got that, and I said, this is the one. They're coming out with steel ones this year, too, which is nice, better than plastic. Amazing, yeah. thank you. Anyway. Well, we'll crack on in a minute. Thank you for having me, that's my talk. Um, <laughs> Can you hear us at the back okay? Are you sure? Yeah. Yeah, okay, okay, brilliant. So look, Dan, um, we met about 10 years ago, maybe a little less. And, um, and watching you on Instagram and watching you in real life is always joyful. But people don't know who you are necessarily. Could, can you give me like one minute on what you do? And that's the last thing we're gonna do about what you do. Yeah, one, one minute. minute. Oh God. Oh well, uh, you know, Bingo told me last night is I should just say I'm an artist, so there you go. Wonderful, no. Dan. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a designer, I'm a photographer, I'm a, I'm a singer, musician, um, do all sorts of a cappella stuff and producing, recording, directing, and I, I like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a professional and non-professional creative. I mean, that's just, um, that's what it's blossomed into. Uh, lifelong, lifelong maker of things and solver of problems, hopefully. Tell me about and singing. And teacher. Oh, singing. Is it a singer? I've been doing, uh, I've been doing, I've been doing a cappella for, uh, like, in, in ensembles since I was 12. So a very long time now. Um, my brother and I both, we kind of got into it very young, into singing choruses, uh, and specifically, how many of you he have heard of a barbershop quartet, <laughs> right? How many, keep your hands up if you think, if the image in your head is like pinstripes and a straw boater and, yep, okay. <laughs> we didn't do that type. Um, I've done that a little bit at Disney. I grew up in Miami, uh, so, so Disney was like three hours north, and I never went when I was a kid. I've actually been to Disney more as a cast member than I have as a, as a guest. Um, and uh, so I have sung in the barbershop quartet that's on Main Street, the Dapper Dans, that was lots of fun. But um, if you've ever seen or heard of The Music Man, a lovely, lovely Broadway musical, um, I was a fan of that. My dad had the VHS of the movie, the film, The Music Man, and I would watch it when I was a kid. And, um, and then when I was about 11, 12, my parents took my brother and me to a, to a concert they thought would be interesting because it would be different, and it was a barbershop chorus and loads of quartets and it's this thing. And to me, I was like, it was like seeing a cartoon in real life, except I was seeing this thing where these four guys on a, on a movie from the 50s had opened their mouths and just made music, and suddenly it was right in front of me, and I was captivated, and I like, changed, changed my life, really. And I haven't stopped doing it since. We're gonna come on to that in a minute, I think. Thank you for that. Fair enough. And look, I, I ask everyone the same three questions. I'm gonna ask them of you. Um, tell me what your child, well, you can, you've maybe answered one of them already. Tell me what your childhood tasted like smelled like mm. and sounded like? Oof, tasted like. Um, I mean, it's really just my mum's uh, cooking. So I'm, I am half English, um, my accent isn't, but um, my mum's from uh, kind of Southeast Essex way. She's not an Essex girl, so. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I, <laughs> Own it. And I, uh, she, she did wear, um, apparently wear leather, like white patent leather um, boots when she was younger, but you know. Thing. Uh, yeah, so I, but I grew up, I grew up in, in Florida, which doesn't have much of a culture. It's kind of like a very, you know, the oldest building there is maybe 100 years old now. And uh, so it's just a mishmash of all sorts of things. So I grew up with uh, whatever food my mom could, could produce that was like what she grew up with and what her comfort stuff was. So I just think, yeah, it's just a lot of seafood, 
That's yeah. what it tasted. It tasted like it tasted like my my mom's upbringing, basically. <laughs> <laughs> tasted like Essex. <laughs> Eels. <laughs> um, a lot of fresh fish, thankfully, which is which the two places have in common. Did you, uh, when we were in Florida, the, the whole eating an alligator thing. I've done that once. It's horrible. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit gamey. Yeah, well, yeah. it's just pointless. So yeah. Pleasant. Yeah. Um, so that's what it tasted like. Yep. It tasted like Essex. <laughs> I'm gonna make a T-shirt of that, I think. Uh, my childhood tasted of Essex. Yeah. What did it smell like? It smelled. It smelled like the ocean. Like honestly, um, I grew up uh, between like less than a mile from the ocean for the first few years, and then about two, three miles from the ocean the rest of like my my life living there before I moved to the UK. And uh, uh, you could just you could smell the sea air all the time. Did, um, it pull? Did, it, did, it, did it pull you to the ocean? Oh, yeah. No, I was a water baby, for sure. Uh, and I was a competitive swimmer in my teens and then again in my, my 20s. I was very lucky that I discovered swimming because the, um, the International Swimming Hall of Fame and the U.S. national team are based in Fort Lauderdale. So my home pool just happened to be one of the best places with the best coaches that you could find in the U.S. That's amazing. Uh, and it was right across from the beach, too. So you'd go into the pool for hours on a Saturday morning especially, and then from the pool to the ocean with everyone <laughs> and just play in the water, yeah. I mean, weirdly, I mean, we're the most landlocked part of the country, but it's similar. So Loughborough University is mm. the home of the, um, the British swimming team. Oh, amazing. Um, apart from for 11 months of the year when they're in Queensland. But we call it the home because <laughs> they are here. <laughs> that's true. Only 11 months. Yeah, so they're yeah. away in Queensland for 11 months of the year. <laughs> apart from Adam Peaty, who trains in his garden in Derby. Wow. Um, in one of those pools. Oh, wow. Yeah, he's a yeah. good man. He's a very good man, I'm told. So, so that's what it smelled like. What did it sound like? Was that, so you're younger than me. You're, I'm, I'm guessing you grew Thank up you. I'm guessing you grew up in, guessing up in the 80s. How old are you? 54. All right, so we've got, uh, we've got 10 years between us. Yeah. Yeah. Your 64 look good. Fuck <laughs> <laughs> off. Well, you grew up in the 80s then, so tell me what it sounded like. Um... It, it didn't sound much like the 80s. Um, my mom and dad listened to me. They were music lovers, uh, not singers. They would never call themselves singers, but they, they could both kind of carry a tune, but they, weren't, they didn't sing. Um, not properly. Uh, and uh, not that it matters, right? But, but I, my, my dad listened to so much. Like, he had all his LPs, and so, and, uh, but he had a very, very like, wide interest in music. So we, at Christmas, we had steel pan music, like steel pan Christmas music because he'd spent so much time for work in the Caribbean. And, uh, and so like, that's the sound of my Christmas time is steel pan Christmas songs, right? <laughs> Which is lovely. It's actually, it still, still warms my heart. Um, but we had classical music because my dad was a big fan of classical. My mom was a massive Beatles and Elvis fan, so we had loads of that. She went to see the Beatles when she was 12 in, um, in South End, which is amazing. And my dad was a fan of the Eagles and, uh, and Elton John and Billy Joel as well as every bit of street corner harmony from like he grew up in Brooklyn and in New York and so all of that like New York rock and roll in the 50s and 60s like he had all these 45s so it was this I had this really big span so depending on the day we could be listening to like some random group from the 50s who made one 45 right two singles uh, or we could be listening to, to Mozart or Beethoven uh, or you know and Elton John the next day I was named after an Elton John song um, so yeah, it, it sounded like all the music. Um, I yeah, I, I, I feel very lucky. And, and how did that go down with your friends? I mean, your friends were, were they were they into that? Or were they into much more kind of garagey, kind of street punk '80s stuff? Um, I had a very small group of friends that I hung out with uh, in like pr primarily my teens, and we would we would actually my best friend Lewis and I we would listen to the oldies radio station, which was basically playing music from the '60s and '70s at that time. And that's what we listened to, I love that. like occasionally something that was more contemporary, um, because you did, like um, the, like there are certain songs that we all have from from our teens that like just put us right back there, like Lisa Loeb and Nine Stories, yeah. right? Lisa Loeb, like the minute that Stay comes on, I'm like 16 again, and going through a breakup, right? And it's <laughs> <laughs> um, Don't so say that often. That must be that. Do you would you choose to revisit that emotion at difficult times? Oh fuck no. No, no, no. It did, no, I do, I do. I'm being, I'm being facetious. No, I, I, I love the emotional uh, um, strength of our reaction to, um, to music. Yeah. I wanted to be a music therapist when I was in my, my teens. I mean, I, part of me still does, and I think anytime I'm doing music, especially when I'm directing or coaching groups, 
I feel like that's music therapy, but also performing when I'm in one, you know, my, my quartet at the minute, which is the only music that I do right now. When we're performing, that's a form of music therapy for us when, as we're sharing, because you can't be in the middle of it. You can't be making that music without feeling it. It just doesn't work. And for everyone in the audience, it's therapy, yeah. you know, because every, everyone reacts in a different way. And it's, it's one of the great bonds of performing in that way. I love that. I really mm. do. It was expunged from my life when I was about seven. Mr. Thompson was my, our headmaster. He, um, we were singing for a school play, I think. Mm. He came along the, the row listening, so really with his ear right where he was mad. And he went past me, and I thought, Phew. and then he came back. <laughs> Can you mind? Oh, God. <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry. Oh. And everybody else. Oh. I've, had, I've, had, I've had to have that conversation with one guy in, in, in the chorus I used to direct. Um, bless him. He was, the hardest working, he was the hardest working member of the chorus, which was a, a, a volunteer organization. So, and and he, he was the guy who was kind of the glue administratively. <laughs> he was, you know, retired. He was in his 70s at the time already. He loved doing it. He could not carry a tune in a bucket. Um, and and we had, I had to have that conversation. I said, look, like, I will continue to work. I'm not going to kick you out. This was soon after my brother and I started, uh, st like, took over directing. I think I was 21 and my brother was 18. So here, here are these, like, the youngest people in the group who have been in since we were 12 and 9, and suddenly we were taking over and, you know, making changes. And, like, we're not kicking you out. We want you on stage, but <laughs> we're going to ask you to not sing certain passages. <laughs> and he, he was totally game. He loved being on stage. He, he wanted to do anything he could to contribute, but it was so, I hated having to say that to him. But see, so that, that's interesting, because what, what you've done there is you've found something else for him to do, maybe, or you're directing him in a different direction. I yeah. would just shut up. Mm. So that's, you, that, yeah, so that's horrible, I hate that. It's, it's, it's harsh. No, but it's you, cruel. You, you were talking about the music, and I'm really fascinated by this, um, this mashup of, of classical, but I'm really interested in this like, late 40s, early 50s, mm. rock and roll, this, this whole kind of, you know, rock and roll was a, was a black musical form before it was a white musical form. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I love that. I'm guessing you weren't playing that digitally back in your childhood. I'm guessing you were no. playing that um, analog. Yeah, analog, yeah, for everything. I mean, it was just LPs were the main thing. And then, like, some cassettes. But, you know, this, my dad's record collection was what we played. Yeah. Um, which was great, because there, there was this tactile experience which now everyone's kind of coming back to. That was just the experience he had always had. And so I grew up with that same experience. It's why I feel like I didn't, I didn't really experience the 80s that much. I mean, I had a couple of like puffer vests. <laughs> um, but, uh, but uh, you, know, uh, you know, when I was in my single digit years and my early teens, I just, I experienced life very much like my parents had experienced life because they'd both moved to Florida from different places a place that didn't have its own culture. They brought their own bits of culture with them, so the house was full of, full of bookshelves, like floor-to-ceiling books. Um, and my mom had brought whatever English kind of culture and familiarity she could with her. And the walls were covered in, in paintings, from, uh, mostly from friends or people that, that they'd each kind of known. And one painting by my grandmother was on the wall. And like, so the, the environment was very much its own thing, yeah. its little like time capsule almost. Well, I, li I like that. We, we've always strived, to, striven, stri striven, to have um, a shared space in the house that is 3D, that, that, that sticks out from the walls, mm. and, that, and that you can sink into a little. And, re and the, the noises are really important. And I fell down that trap of going, oh, look, CDs are better than vinyl. I put my vinyl in the garage, let it get wet and throw it away. Oh. I know, I know. Um, and then rush into to, to digital, and, and, and you lose you lose so much. It's nice to have, always have music on, and that's amazing. Yeah. But you lose the sequence. So so for me, I'm going to move that this way. So for me, I know I asked for this. We haven't used it yet, but it's fine. <laughs> You're going to use it in a minute. Yeah, we're. So for me, the whole idea of analog is is one of of sequence and series playing tracks in series. Mm -hmm. I really like. And when I remember when Daisy, who's in here somewhere. Um, there she's got her first car. Number one, she drove way too fast in that Mini. Number two, so there'd be like three seconds of a song yeah. and it'd be on to the next one. I'm like, yeah, but look, we look. I didn't mind when it was Kanye, like, guess, get through that. <laughs> but with the other stuff, I, I like to follow it through. And yeah. I, I really like the, the, the fact that when we grew up, albums were written to take you on a journey. 
Yeah, they were curated. Yeah. And it was a big deal when it changed too. My mom, I remember this vividly because my mom and dad, the overlap musically was the Beatles. My dad didn't like Elvis. I think he was just jealous. Um, but, uh, was it the 68 years your mom really liked? My, well, my mom, my mom loved the early Beatles. Yeah. Um, no, my, the Elvis years, I meant. Oh, sorry, the Elvis years, years. yes, yes. Um, I mean, they both wore, they all wore black jackets, right? Black leather. But um, Elvis looked amazing he did. in 68. Yeah. Truly. Yeah, his later years we won't yes. talk about. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so their overlap was the Beatles, but my dad like was mid to late Beatles. My mom was like early to mid Beatles. Wow. And there was like one album or two albums maybe that overlapped in the middle. And so that they both had the full LP. And the American version was a different song order than the British version. And that like my mom could not stand it. Because, you know, who knows why, they, you know, some, some producer or, or, or executive, I think it was Rubber Soul, actually, so, so yeah. So if you went from yep. Drive My Car and didn't go into Norwegian Wood, I'd have some kind of coroner. <laughs> <laughs> no, Wood, yeah. you can't do that. Yeah. So I'm with your mum. Well, and the, and the British version was definitely something that the Beatles would have had more of a hand in, in the order of the songs, yeah. And that's the thing, it's a, there's, a, there's a process to it. You could skip around, but you don't. When you put, you put the needle down and you just let it, you let it go. Yeah. So tell, tell me about, what, what has analog, we'll, go, we'll come into some, get some things in a minute, but what has analog brought to your life? And did you ever fear that you'd lose it, that it would die? Do you, have you clung on to it, or is it just normal for you? No, I, it, it's, it's normal, but, uh, and, and for context, I've spent a big portion, more than, well, yeah, more than half of my design career has been spent focusing on digital things. Not so much for the last 10 years, but was very early on, on the web and like I became a designer using a computer to, to design things even if they were for, for print. And I'm still a big fan of what technology and digital does for us. But we're, we're analog creatures. Yeah. We're, we're physical, tangible beings and, um, and I don't think we can ever actually lose that as a result. We don't lose the connection with analog. We, we maybe forget about it for a while and we, we like new and shiny things. Um, and that's something that, that has happened to me like the pendulum just kind of swings to extremes. Uh, but I've never, I've never worried that I'd lose it, possibly because like, I've always had things like music or exercise, you know, movement yeah. that have anchored me. But, um, you know, and so the, the tech becomes the new and shiny and you get stuck in a screen for a while and everything is pixels and, and bytes. Um, but, uh, but even in my design practice, I always used pen, pencil and paper. Yeah to work things out or a whiteboard or, you know, I like printing things out and spreading them across the floor to wrap my head around them. Um, and I don't think that that's because I'm a certain age. I think that I understand the value in it because I grew up with it and then added digital to it. But I watch my nieces and nephews who are, the eldest is nine and a half, the youngest is about to turn four. And they love the heck, everything in their life is tangible and physical. And digital things are part of it. You know, they'll have iPad time every once in a while, and they love movies and everything on a screen. But like, you know, when you let them be children, they're just, it's, everything's physical, everything's tangible. It's just, it's not something that we can lose in that way, I think. No, I'm, I'm with you, it's really interesting to, when I think of every creative agency, and there are a few in the room that I've ever worked in or with, the first thing you do when you're coming up with a new, or when you're faced with a new brief, is put stuff on the wall. Hmm is to create a wall of, and it might be the inspiration wall, mm -hmm. but that then sl slowly gets the ideas wall, yeah. and then that gets to the, um, to the way that you express things wall. And, and, it, and being able to stand back and look at something is magical. And, and I've tried to use Canva and stuff, and there, there's some real strength to those things. But when I want to write a new talk or do something new, it goes on the wall. And yeah. Massive sticky pads. There are a lot of there are a lot of really fascinating tools digitally, and I still I use a lot of them. I I, I will try anything the minute that I hear people talking about it in a in a positive way. It's like I want to get my hands on it. I'm basically a perpetual bleeding edge beta tester of just things because I like to know about them. But like we've built ourselves like these rectangles that we try to fit everything into, and scaling things down so you can see more things in a tiny rectangle is not the same as spreading things out. You know, I've, des I've designed a handful of books in my des re more recent design career, and like you print things out and you put them on the floor and you walk on them. Yeah. Like, cause, because that's how we as humans understand scale. We can see things that big and then we can reach down and pick something up and we can shuffle it around and there's no pinch and zoom mechanic in an interface that can 
mimic that. We can get close to it, but the, it's like the, the curve never quite gets right up to the edge. Touch. No. no. And, and, and like, uh, I mean, I think of, I think of uh, like people like programmers and developers who I've worked with lots of software engineers, right? And everything is digital. Everything is some sort of digital tool and development tool and workflow tool and tools, tool, tools, all digital. And uh, about 10 years ago, I was a uh, creative director at Moo. How many of you have had Moo cards? Right? Um, or at least, you know, and everyone else has heard of them somehow. But um, I'm we, so cute. yeah, it's a small, it's, well, it's a dwindling number. They've not made the best decisions uh, <laughs> in the last handful of years, I think. But it's, uh, it, it's not because people don't like paper, right? It's just because the world has changed in lots of different ways. But, um, uh, but like we, one of the things that we did while I was CD was we redesigned the office. So, and it was primarily me, it was an outside firm and then me and my, uh, my senior product designer that like touched everything. And the design team's corner, like we put whiteboard paint on all the walls. Like that was one of the things that Paul and I said, no, we have to do this because we were using tiny little whiteboards and we're like, no, 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 screw that. We're just, the walls are gonna be it. And we, once we had that, the dev team that was over on the other side of the same floor, like they saw it and they got so, they were like, no, we, can we have that too? Creative envy. Yep, because they, they in, once they saw what we were doing with it, that we were just able to stand at the wall and we could scribble things up here and then we could have things here, we could have a schedule over here and it was all visible. You didn't have to open a new tab or, or email someone. Um, they realized the, the value in that. Um, and it was, just, it was just interesting to see that because again, we're, we're naturally tangible beings. We want to be and yet, like something new and shiny comes along and we also want that too and we can kind of forget we get lost in things like slack and everything else and like well, tunnel I vision I, 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 I hate it yeah I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a fan but you reminded me when I wrote when I wrote my first the first book I wrote um, it was a workbook I didn't know everyone was writing proper books I thought we were all writing workbooks um, so I wrote it to be filled in and stuff and I, and I, and I had it on the screen and it looked I could see that it looked nice and I had Anthony or I'm going to make it look even nicer um, but I couldn't get a sense of how it would be used. Mm. And it's, this took me so long. I printed it all out, the right size, so scaled everything down, and then I had to print double-sided, but that's, that's a nightmare, mm -hmm. getting the right bit on the, wrong, on the back of the right wrong bit. Horrible. It took me about a day, and I finally did it, and I folded it all up, and I, and I put a big staple through the middle of it, and I went, yeah, that's a good book. <laughs> it's not changed, you just printed it out, but having been able to flick through it and feel it mm -hmm. and, and, and touch it made such a, and it felt like the right size as well. I thought, yes, it's not a pamphlet. Mm -hmm. I've done all right, it's good. Yeah. 12 years later, it's still not a pamphlet. <laughs> <laughs> They're still printing it, so it must have been good. T t t t tell me about some of the things that you've, you've, bought, you've bought here. Well, I'm super keen to hear the stories that sit around these. Well, so the, the um, so that everyone knows, because there aren't like titles up of what this talks about. Like, um, I thought it would be nice for us to talk about the, the joy that can be found in, in tangible analog things, right? Like not just on the, the hipster side of it, right? But I, like I, uh, there's a reason for people coming back to things. There's a reason why people are shooting more film today than they were five years ago or 10 years ago. And a lot of it are younger people who are discovering it for the first time because of course, it's far more interesting than a black glass rectangle, right? Um, and uh, like I'm, I'm old enough to, to, to know these things, but you know, then you kind of forget about them for a while. I, sh I, shoot, I shoot film, I've got film here. People can, like, if anyone wants to look at like, some film and contact sheets later, they're more than, more than welcome to. Um, I shoot digital as well when I need to, but I like shooting film because two reasons, two reasons. Well, a lot more than two reasons, but these two reasons I can hold up. Um, like here's color negative, black and white negative. This is an archive. This stuff will, if you treat it well, this stuff will last way longer than any hard drive or battery. Um, you know, you can archive this properly with tried and true tested um, methods. Uh, you know, climate controlled storage and that stuff will outlast all of us in this room, right? Um, and you can also, go into the dark room and, and print them out very easily, right? No computer necessary for any of this. <laughs> um, it goes from, from camera into chemistry, then this comes out, and then you put that under a light in a dark room, and then you expose it very briefly onto paper, and then you put it into some more chemistry, and you have a thing. And, uh, and it's a process, 
But just like I was uh, grinding my beans this morning by hand, I have a hand no, grinder I travel with. <laughs> wow, yes. I'm so, now I'm so glad that I brought this out, so I, because that's like, no, no, I mean it, right? I travel. I, I, it's penis pump, thank you very much. It's, no. Uh, so I travel, I travel with, a, with a, an AeroPress and a hand grinder and, and beans that I discover everywhere, and it's like a little bit of a, it's like a five minute ritual every morning that um, takes slightly longer than an electric grinder, but is way more satisfying because of having to put that time in. I'm with you all the way, and you know, bringing these out makes me quite emotional because my father was a photographer, and, and, and I spent yeah, this. We've talked about this so briefly, haven't we? Yeah, we have. I spent so much time in the dark room with him. He needed someone to help him, cheap labor. Um, and you called it chemistry. Back then, I thought it was magic. Mm. Like a blank piece of paper goes in, and you watch it in the dev, and it comes out with an image on, but if you don't get it out at the right time and put it in the wash, it carries on deving. And, um, and I thought it was magic. And, but when I think back to those times, the smell of the chemicals was mm. really powerful. But the proximity to my father in the dark mm. was really powerful. Oh, I bet. And I miss that. I miss <laughs> that, like knowing he's, he's there. And Dad, I can't do this bit. Can you help me? Yeah, I can help you. And then I used, my job was to take these things, mm. and where there was a glitch, I'd get a little red ink. It oh, yeah. A, and, a, and a very, oh God, I can't draw because it could save my life a very fine brush and just to, to, to touch up mm. negatives. Mm -hmm. So I was the toucher upper, that's not what it sounds like. <laughs> and, um, and, and, the, and the dark room person. Yeah. So it's not about, it is the analog, but it's never about what comes out. It's no, the it's, it's the process, yeah. And I mean, and, and you talk about magic. Like I carry this little instant camera around with me everywhere and I use it for like little behind the scenes when I'm on projects in between because you can, you get something immediately but you can give it to people but it's still film, it's still magic. Yeah. My nieces and nephew love the shit out of this. Mm. They understand it, but it's also magic. It, like, the, f the phone or any kind of digital camera, like, that's not interesting. That's not magical. It's just normal to them, which is, of, of course it is, because they've just grown up into it. Um, this is magical, but what I think is amazing is this is still magical to me. Like, if you take, the, I'm gonna take a picture of all of you. Watch this, let's, uh, I don't know, the flash will probably go on, we'll see. Yeah, it will, and I'll take a picture of you too. Don't, you won't be left out. But you know, it, you take the picture, it spits a thing out, and then it's just gonna, it's gonna take a bit of time. Here we go, ready, and you know, oh, no flash on that side. Oh. Because they're all light. There, yes. <laughs> the light and the darkness, here we go. And these things, you know, it's, there's nothing there, and in like five minutes there will be something there, and that, like, that's magic to anybody, even if you understand the chemistry and how it works. It's still, this is, instant film actually is one of the most complicated chemical things that humans have invented. And, it's, it, and, and that's why it's magical, I think, too, is that it doesn't seem complicated at all. It just sits there and something appears. And so yeah, I'm, I think there's just a lot of joy in, because we're human, just like Qigong this morning, or running or swimming in the ocean or a lake, I run, I just did a half marathon in Glasgow a couple of weeks ago, um, and, uh, and I, I was never a runner. And I started traveling, I can't travel with a pool <laughs> or a bike, not, not easily. Um, and so seven, six, seven years ago, I decided I had to learn to not hate running. And, and I'm so glad that I set my mind to it and got some coaching and like the right shoes and everything else, because then I went, oh, this is actually quite enjoyable. And now I run insane distances for me, like for someone who hated running like eight years ago. Um, and it's, you know, feet on pavement, it's, or feet in the grass, or in the sand, or in the ocean, like anything that we can touch. Like if you've ever, you know, spent too much time working on computers, and then you get to take like a pottery class, or you do wood carving, or something like, or cooking, baking, you know, it's, I think it's why during the pandemic so many people rushed to things that weren't Zoom, right? <laughs> right, they were the exact polar opposite, and they felt so good. Right? Especially when we had all of that stuff taken away from us, we realized how important it was to just go for a walk or, or you know, make some food or you know, bake some bread. And, uh, and for me, one of the, like, I did the same. Even though I was already doing a lot of tangible things, I, um, I, I got into the most, I'm, I'm gonna say it's the most ridiculous thing, but uh, it's not really. Um, this is the other prop I'm gonna take here. Um, so I, I'm old enough that I learned, look at that, this 
magic happening. <laughs> Pictures happening already. Um, I'm old enough that I learned how to type on my dad's um, portable typewriter, an old Olympia that my mom and dad, um, how's there mud on my typewriter? That's probably amazing. Probably my fault. That's oh, probably mine too, my boots are covered in it. Um, this isn't my dad's, this is another one, because um, during the pandemic I was spending like everyone like six, eight hours on Zoom every day. And I was also, at the time, uh, I'd gotten kind of a bit stranded in Florida. I was there for two weeks, everything shut down, visiting family. I'm like, all right, I'm here for a while. And you know, it's perpetual sunshine, which is great, unless you're spending all your time on a computer where you have to have all the blinds closed and like dark room. So I, I really wanted to have some part of my day that I could be outside, but still feeling productive, because I was still going for walks and runs and everything, but I wanted to also just enjoy the weather and do stuff. And, uh, and I, I, I couldn't find my dad's portable typewriter. It's somewhere in mom's house. Um, but we, we, looked for, we looked for a while, couldn't find it. And, uh, and, and designer in me started looking up, you st this is, when you're a designer, and I, I, or just any kind of creative interest in things, you start pulling on certain threads, and then you can't let go. And suddenly it's like you just, you've got a, a line, you're on a sailboat, and you're just like pulling for all, your, all you can. And I, I spent six months researching typewriters and brands and their history, and I just, I, I just, I had time on my hands too. I like downloaded all of this information just to see like what typewriter should I buy. And now I've, I'm not even gonna, I'm not gonna admit unless someone really asks me how many I own now. How many do you oh, own? Oh, fuck off. <laughs> and are they I, all golf or have you got keys? No, they're, they're all manual. None of, one of them is electronic and I haven't got it working again. Um, that's a separate question. But like, I mean, they're, they're lovely design objects. I mean, look at this thing, right? Like, this is just a beautiful thing. That's, that's what got me. This is what got me into photography. I liked cameras. I, I didn't think I was a photographer. I bought a folding Polaroid SX-70, right? You've seen those, like, the leather and chrome things, the original Polaroid, in, like, integral film camera. And I thought it was when Polaroid announced they were discontinuing their film. I bought the camera. They were cheap. No one wanted them. Um, and I thought, this will look good on my shelf. I'll shoot a couple of packs and that'll be it. That was 2006. I loved every image that came out of it in a way that I'd never loved any image that came out of a camera before. Edwin Land's design of making a camera that would make people love photography, it worked on me. And as a designer, I was obsessed with that. I went, I found out about it, I read up about it. I'm like, oh, he, he designed this to make people love photography. That was the original brief, that was the, the, the aim of his design. His, well, in, in a couple of different ways. The story goes, that because instant photography existed before that through Polaroid, and, uh, but you had to like coat the, the, uh, the negative that came out, and you had to do all sorts of things. There was a process involved, so you didn't have to take it to a lab, but it was involved. And, uh, and his daughter, apparently, one time, a uh, young daughter, like, asked why it, why it couldn't just appear. And he said, that's a good, good question. Let me, go, let me go see if I can make that happen. <laughs> and then, so he just put it all into one little pack. And, that's, and, and then the camera was designed to be a joyful thing. It, like, it's like a transformer. It unfolds, and it's, it's really, really fun. And, uh, and then I, and I've got, like, 60 different cameras now because the first few years of me taking photos were actually me as a designer obsessing over how a different design of a camera affected the photographer and the images and everything else. And it was the same with typewriters. So I got one. And I've, I've, got a, mm, I've got a spreadsheet. Um, <laughs> I've got a spreadsheet with models and names. I've, yeah, it's, it's, uh, in, in just under two years, it's up to like just over 70. It's ridiculous. I don't collect anything. I have cameras and I have typewriters. No one needs more than one camera. I promise you no one needs more than one typewriter, <laughs> but, but, they're, but they're gorgeous objects. That's that, beautiful. And, and, and as a designer, what I obsess over, this was made in the early 70s. It still does exactly what it was designed to do. You can still get paper, you can still get ribbons. Other ribbons. Yep. And, and every, every machine I have is from kind of mid-century stuff, so from the, the early 50s through to the early 70s is my, is my window of the, the industrial design that I like. And I love using them, I love typing on them, I love figuring out how they were designed and how they were engineered and why one feels different than the other. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of physics involved, there's a lot of math involved in that and engineering, and th but they're all these beautiful objects as well, which we've lost a little as well. We've lost personality in our objects. We, like this one's in really nice condition, but I've got some others that are, were used and loved and they still work because they were designed to have people actually just hammer away at them for decades and you know, like 70 years on so these things are still trucking just as well. Minute.
not for me on these. My pinkies are not strong enough. <laughs> it's really, it takes a lot, of, a, a lot more strength to do it. But I can still kind of touch type. I'm just a, slower on this than a keyboard. But, but it's, it, it provides me joy. And, dur and again, during a, like starting during the pandemic when I you know, couldn't do much, I found a typewriter, an Olivetti, a lovely like, like teal Olivetti from the 60s. And, uh, and I started, I had my coffee in the morning, sat outside with a little card table in the sunshine with the birds, and I would type up my to-do list and my morning thoughts and everything. It would be a very productive start to the day in the sunshine, no computer in sight. And since then, I've written some articles and essays uh, on the typewriter. I've, uh, I've, I've wrote loads of letters and mailed them to people, which is fantastic, too. It gave me an excuse to design a little notepad that was mimicked. I mimicked my grandfather's uh, notepad from, that he had in like the 40s and 50s, um, which also American felt kind of nice. My American grandfather, yeah. Um, my, uh, yeah, my aunt still had it, like a page from it that had one of my grandmother's recipes on it. And I said, send me a photo of that. I'm going to copy this for myself. Uh, so I send people letters. I write to-do lists most mornings. Um, I've do, done project proposals like on it. Like It's amazing how you just have no distractions and you can focus and you can do it in a park if you want. <laughs> uh, or at home or in an Airbnb or a hotel, it doesn't really matter. Not in a cafe generally or a train or a plane. <laughs> but imagine, imagine what that would have been like because yes. trains would have been full of people on typewriters at one point. Planes would have been full of people typing. Cafes would have had that, this wonderful like soundtrack and the noise of it. Yeah, the, the, the modern techno of a typewriter. I, I love I, I, I'm not going to type anything on it r just now. I, I can later. But just like, listen, this is a very snappy one too. Like just, uh, right? And, and when, you get, when you get to the right point, uh, this bell isn't the loudest one, but let's see. <laughs> and that tells you you've done something. You've done something <laughs> to a point, and, and now, and now you've got you to gotta do this. And then you get, it's, it's a rhythm. It's, it's very reminiscent, actually. I was thinking about this rhythm, the rhythm that's involved with it, of the doing, and then the sound that triggers something, and then doing another motion when we were doing Qigong this morning. It's like there's a flow, there's a real flow that you miss. We talk, you know, going back to process. That's the thing about things that are tangible um, and analog, is that there is a process involved to using them, even if it's a, an LP, right? You put it on, and then the, you let it play. And then it finishes, and you got to flip it over. And like, there's, there's, a, there's a point that marks when something else needs to happen from you. When we're typing on a, you know, in Word or Pages or anything on a, on a computer, it's infinite. It's just you go until you're done, but there's nothing that interrupts that other than, you know, spell check yelling at you for something. <laughs> the wrong kind of interruptions, basically. They're not helpful things. At least they got rid of that bloody paper clip. <sighs> yes, but I mean, think about how many distraction-free... Sorry, I didn't have a, there's supposed to be a, a, an audio man yelling at me for that falling down. Um, think about how many distraction-free writing apps there are now, yeah. right? Which are all, all of them trying to get back to this in some sort of way, but they never, again, the curve gets close to the edge, but it never quite comes to the same point as it. It's not as good as this. Anyone should get these. I remember They're you awesome. buying that Olivetti. Mm. And, um, and of course, I'm so easily, persuadable, that I then went out and started looking at second-hand typewriters. I think all your followers did, because the price of a second-hand Olivetti in the UK doubled in about a month. I'm sorry. I called it the Ruben effect. <laughs> and it was, it was a nightmare. But, but and then I saw this one that you put up, and yeah. I was thinking, I don't want an Olivetti anymore. I want an orange one. <laughs> Beautiful, isn't it? But you're an we can get you a yellow one. I'd love a yellow one. Yeah. I'd love that. This is, I'll this, find you one. This is, this is amazing. Do you find the fact that you are slower on this, do you find that helps to your creative process? Yeah. And it's not slower, really. Um, that's, that's the thing, right? Everyone assumes film is slower than digital for photography. Everyone assumes that this is slower, right? Uh, but just like everyone would assume that you can't get as much done in a four-day work week than a five-day work week. <laughs> Right, but the reality is, is the complete inverse. Um, because there are no distractions, because I'm not worrying about spelling or formatting or anything, uh, or backspacing. I mean, you can backspace, but if you make a mistake and you actually want to correct that, you just hit X over it a bunch of times. Like it's really, which, is, which feels great. It's like, cro it's like writing a to-do list. Or when I type my to-do lists on this, I check things off with a, with a pencil or pen. Usually like a marker, actually, because then you can just cross things out. And that feels 
better because it's, it, it's tangible and we relate to that better. So I am, I'm actually faster with this because nothing gets in my way. So if I'm trying to get a first draft of something out, it, it seems to come faster on this than it does on a computer. I've been using computers for way more of my life, like for 30, over 30 years I've been using computers and I should be faster on them. But um, I can type something up on this. If it needs to be digital, I've got all sorts of OCR apps on my phone. I can, I can just snap a picture, like in Acrobat on my phone. It converts it, and it pretty much has no errors because typewritten text is perfect for optical character recognition. <laughs> so it's actually super, it takes me less than a minute to go from typewritten page to something that I can make edits to or tweak on the computer. Um, and that is actually way faster because the computer is great for editing. The computer is great for changes, for flexibility, but the computer is not good for removing distractions and focus. Do, do, do you think, one of, one of my frustrations is I'm offered too many chances to edit and go back. I, I kind of like the one shot. I, in fact, when I do a talk, I mm. don't want to ever rehearse it. I just want to stand up and, Same. and, and do it. And Imagine if we rehearsed this. Like a, a shit show. Oh, we still be on cameras. <laughs> I'd be in the dark room with my dad. <laughs> but but, but th this is the sound of my childhood as well. Mm. We had a typewriter at home. Mm. It was a normal thing to have yeah. at home. Very few things were typed, but, but, but we had one. Um, I, I'm, I'm, really in, I'm really interested to, to think about how else analog has changed your creative process. Because you, you know, quite clearly you're an incredibly creative individual. How has analog changed that? How has, it, how has dipping your toe back into that world changed how you come up with ideas? Um, it's, made me, it's made me really look forward to the time that I spend coming up with ideas, thinking. It's just like I, I like going for walks when I'm trying to think of things. When I'm writing a new talk or, or kind of trying to come up with something from scratch, I go for a walk and maybe I'll record a voice note rather than even write things down. Just to, the movement helps me get things out of my head, but it's also just fresh air and everything else that comes with it. So getting away from computers, you know, 12 year old me was going toward computers because that was the new shiny thing and, and that probably was me for a good 15, 20 years after that. Um, and then I got to a point where everything was digital with very few exceptions and it was, it was, it was stalling me in ways. Um, so so I've, I've been, I mean, I've been pushing back on the, on the, the the norms that we tend to like all uh, adopt for a while. Like t 2007, I stopped checking email automatically as someone who was running an agency that did mostly digital work. <laughs> um, but I, I checked it twice a day when I wanted to and then I could block the time out and my attention span would, would be focused on that and communications and that was, it was such a, a, a great thing. I also, that same year, I, I cut out my live TV subscription. I was still living in the US at the time and like that was six years after 9-11. So I, I had horrible insomnia because I was watching 24-hour news every night until 5 a.m., wondering when the next attack was going to be, right? It was miserable. And I just said, I don't need this. I'm going to switch it off. I have the internet. Like, if something happens, I'll find out about it. But I, I, so I, even back then, I was starting to realize I needed to pull back from things. I needed to spend more time outside. That was, around, again, 2006-07, same time I discovered photography. And photography for me back then, if you'd asked me about it, uh, my, my reason for liking photography was that it got me away from the screen. It got me outside. Because I was living in South Florida, spending all my time on a computer, so all my blinds were closed. All the, I was in a dark room with the sunshine outside every day, and it was kind of mental. Um, and, and so it's been, what's that, 14, 15 years now yeah. that I've been trying, intentionally pushing the pendulum the other direction. And it only gets better. I haven't lost uh, anything. Are you happier? Yeah. If I'm not happier, there's because of other things than that. But I mean, I, as a creative, like, you know, the, you've always got the ups and downs, but as a, as a creative, like, I look forward to writing things on this. I'm, I've never liked handwriting much because I learned how to type so young, so my, my, my hand strength just wasn't there. Like, I just, I get cramps when I'm writing too much. I would love to, but also my handwriting is crap. Um, because I was typing from, a, uh, from like six years old, five years old, something like Did that. Did you never have a little bobble on your finger from holding your pen? No. I miss mine. Do you miss yours? What, just like a, a you have to explain this to me. I yeah, haven't had this. You can just say oh, just a little, tiny little cavity. oh, yeah, no, you know what? I have that, but you know what it's from? My fucking phone. Oh, no. <laughs> it's like that weird grip of having it. That, yeah, no, I've, I've, I've realized, I, I can see it on this hand. 
Like I've got this little indentation here the from uh, for like the base of the phone holding here just because it's this ridiculous size and yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> it's stupid. I don't do that anymore. That's crazy. So have you got anything else you want to show us? But I mean, I'm going to open it for some questions actually. No, we can't. Like, yeah, I, I, I could bring, well, here we look at these. Let's have a look at the photos. You can go look, they're photos now. They're pictures. Isn't that magic? It's magic. You all look lovely too, so. Um, <laughs> No, well, ask. Most, most of you Let's do. get. I, I'd love. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know about. That. No, they're, they're amazing. They're amazing. And that that, that is. To, so this brought wonder. When I was young, mm. I remember being brought a Polaroid camera, and I loved mine. It had a little squeezy shutter button that allowed you to focus. You squeezed it and turned it, mm. or pressed it. So mm -hmm. it was kind of trying to do two things at once. And I absolutely adored it. And the metal clip on the back that held the back shut mm. and light tight. That was beautifully engineered, mm -hmm. but I got that the same year as I got a handheld transistor radio. <laughs> and it was little, but it had a little strap on it. And I used to walk around the house listening to it, before you any of that. <laughs> and, I, and I really liked the fact that it would go in and out in different places. So I was in the lounge, it would be fine. If I went into the dining room, it would tune in to half another station. <laughs> and I'd have to retune it. And there's something beautiful about it. So look, in terms of questions, mm. um, yeah. who would like to ask a question? Yeah, Ilana, here, this is trouble. Hi. Oh, this thing. This is, uh, this is made by Fujifilm. It's an Instax. Oh, it's an Instax. They, um, and, and also, if you need any confirmation about how, many, how much people love these things, Fuji makes digital cameras. They make all sorts of different things. The Instax line is their biggest selling photographic product way over all their digitals. And also, for multiple years running, it's been the highest selling product full stop at Christmas on Amazon. It are like Instax things. Yeah, people, all ages love this. It's That's wonderful. It's really interesting, because Fuji, uh, Cybershot, Sony was, were first into digital, but Fuji were the people that, I think most people's first digital camera was a Fuji. Mm. It was square, they were almost like it was that, it was that kind of little, The little tiny point and shoot yeah, things, yeah. And for them to come and own this, uh -huh. brilliant. Question here. Um, and what made you feel differently about mistakes or what a mistake is? Yeah, which is another thing that I started um, thinking about a lot in the mid 2000s. I was clearly going through some stuff. Um, you know, I turned 30 in 2007, so like there were, you know, you there are cycles where where things um, things change for you and you you reevaluate re and. Uh, I remember doing a talk about mistakes, actually. It was to an educational conference in Orlando. It was a bunch of teachers. And I, like, I, I, I'd gotten to the point where I, 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 didn't like, I didn't like the way people were reacting to certain words. So mistake like, has all these connotations. Experiment doesn't, right? Um, an experiment doesn't have like, a, you know, a negative outcome. It has expected outcome or something else, right? But, but you'll learn something from, from all of it. And there was a lot of talk in the design circles in, the, in tech at the time that I gave this talk about embracing failure. Uh, because, and you had to say embracing failure because otherwise failure was a bad thing. And I was like, well, why don't we just not use that word anymore because we're so programmed to think of that as a bad thing. Why, why think of it as failure? And so, yeah, like that's, that's something that really, uh, it's something that appeals to me about this, but I didn't, I didn't think that up on my own. I watched this um, early in the pandemic. This is also what set me on this course. There's a lovely documentary called California Typewriter that came out in 2016. And it was filmed in like 2012, 13, 14. Go watch it. It's named after a, a, a now defunct um, shop in Berkeley, but there's another typewriter repair shop in Berkeley as well that gets all the business. Um, and I've been to it, and it's wonderful. It was like going to this little kind of mecca. There are all these places. It's, it's an amazing world I've discovered, and I'll talk to you at length outside of when I'm on stage, if anyone wants. But, uh, but this documentary, one of the people in the documentary is Tom Hanks, which is, he's a massive typewriter fan. He, he's just, he's like a little kid. He's so joyous about it, and he shares it with everyone. But someone else who's in that, which I really connected with, is John Mayer. Um, and John Mayer uh, switched to typing his lyrics. Like on a, he's using an electric, but it doesn't matter. It's like, he, and he talks about how by not having, like, in his creative process, he's just trying to get stuff out of his head. He's writing the same line six different times to try and find like the rhythm, and he's gonna look at it later and figure out which one is the right pattern, the right vibe. He doesn't need a little squiggly red underline telling him he, he misspelled war, <laughs> right? Because uh, that's not helping him, in the, but it's distracting him in the moment, and he, and, that, and he talks about that. And I connected with that so much when I watched it, I said, yep, that's definitely, I need, I need more of that because all of these things, all this additive design that technology is full of, 
which can be great, can also be not great for humans. It's not human-centric design, and that's something I've always been very intent on focusing on. It. And, uh, and it's, really, it's really difficult to talk to tech people about that because tech people love inventing new things and adding new things, and we see those new things, and we love having that new thing, and, and we get a new device and a new operating system, and every new thing is switched on by default. It's not opt-in. It's, you know, you opt in by buying the new phone or installing the new operating system, and now you've got all of it, whether it's good for you or not, whether you want it or not, and, uh, and, and yeah, mistakes are a, are a completely natural thing. They, you know, we experiment, we, and it doesn't matter. Like, fix that in the edit. Whenever, whenever you get, if you ever get to see a manuscript of, uh, of any classic novel that was written on a typewriter or by hand, pull the fucking mistakes. It's just, they're a mess, they're a mess. That's why editors exist. But that's also why, you know, we can edit our own thing, right? Fix the things later. Write your email, and before you hit send, go back and read it again. <laughs> Which we all know people don't do. There, there was another hand up in the back. Yes, you, hello, hi. Tintypes? Yeah, oh, I, I haven't done tintype. I've, no, I've gone to a tintype studio and I've had a tintype photo, like, photograph made of me and it's magic. It's also an incredibly like, toxic um, bit of chemicals that you have to use for it. But has anyone done, done those? Yeah. Can you explain what a tintype is? What is a tintype? Is a tintype? Uh, uh, oh, let's see. Um, uh, so it's literally, made, instead of a, like, a lot of old negatives were like you had glass negatives where you would coat in some sort of light sensitive thing and these, these negatives are um, either acetate or something similar, it's a plasticky material. A tin type, tin, which uh, tin was used for its uh, stable qualities, that you could coat it with like a, a nasty bit of chemistry that would be light sensitive and then you could put it in other bits of nasty chemistry and the tin would stay stable, stable. it wouldn't be eaten away, nothing would happen to the tin. Um, that's why it was used, so it's basically just a, a base that's used to create the, the negative. That's the short version. Go and look at them. They look fantastic. Incredible. Right, we've got two more questions. We'll go two more. One I'll speak there. to anyone during the breaks, too. We'll I'll be here all day. Henry. So at the back there. Go back to my old laptop scenario. Mm. When you're trying to work on it now, how do you get a technical, like, noticeably work, work on that type of system? Um, what, so like, like phys just fit work physically to work problem? Project problems out on the wall. I used to use the white as well. Yeah, it's. Yeah, I don't know. I um, it it wasn't difficult once they started doing it. So it was the prob the barrier was up here like it is for most things, um, and they wouldn't. It's not like all the time, but um, like you just have to get them scribbling things. It's I think it's 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 easier when the idea is that we've got to you've got to get a, multiple people to see what you're working on yeah. at the same time and it's good for quick things. You wouldn't want to write out you wouldn't want to program on a wall. No, that would I'm, suck. That would be very inefficient. So it's about the it, right yeah. People see how you do it and yep. then everyone gathers and, and, and the magnificence of this system yeah. system um, becomes clear. I, I think it spreads itself. So I'm going to quote Apple, uh, you've not got the wrong system, you've got the wrong people. Um, and, and <laughs> and, well, and it's, it's, it's about using it for the right thing. So if you're trying to figure out uh, like user flows, for instance, you can sketch that much more quickly, and then you can snap some pictures of it and someone can go and like actually... Yeah. <laughs> and the last question, over, I'm sorry that we haven't had time, I'll make more time. The last one here is from Henry, who's also a photographer. Hi, Henry. Mm. Uh, Pertex was roughly the holding company who had the program down the Jackson. Pertex was originally the faculty on typewriter users. Amazing. Fantastic. I, I love this kind of trivia. Yeah. Pertex, I'll tell you as well, Charlie demonstrated this to me. Pertex, that's been uncoated with DWR, is the most amazingly absorbent towel. Now, I only know that because Charlie came out of a shower in Cardigan naked, wrapped <laughs> it, and 
Matt went, it's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> and he's here today. Trust me, he's just here. Um, I love that. There you go. Sit back, sit back down. Sit back down. Before we're done. There we go. Well, Last one. It That's it. Please don't leave it. Thank you all. Thank you. It was fun.